there seems to be a little theme in today's scriptures. It seems to be the devil. But he's not the focus. He's instead the one that we know that the Lord has come specifically to one defeat, right? And to undo all of his works. So when sin came into the world, right? With Adam and Eve's fall, which we heard in the first reading, in came disease and death and the influence of evil, right? And when Jesus came, he began to raise people from the dead, to heal them, and to deliver them from evil spirits. That's good news, right? It's very good news. That Jesus came to defeat the works of the devil. This is good news. This is why we're here, right? Because we believe this, that Jesus actually defeated the work of the devil on the cross, right? And then he does something strange. Jesus, he raises from, he's, he's raised from the dead, and he does something strange. He says, all power and authority is given to me, therefore you guys go. He says to us, as the Father sent me, so I'm sending you. He says to the apostles and to the disciples, I'm giving you authority to heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons, cleanse lepers. And what do we do? We sit around and we're like, oh, that's got to be for somebody else. It's because we don't know who we are. We hear it quite clearly in the gospel today. Jesus says, who are my mother and my brothers? Whoever does the will of God is my brother, sister, and mother. We heard in the first reading, God himself declaring to the devil, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He will crush your head while you strike at his heel. Now we should know what this is referring to. The woman in that case doesn't just refer to Eve and the holy line that would come through Seth. That may be true. But it's a proclamation by God of the coming of a woman who would have a child without the help of a man. Who could that be? But the Blessed Virgin Mary. And who is that offspring who defeats the devil? Jesus. Right? Or do we not believe that he did that? We believe he did that? Yeah, okay. Does Jesus win? Did he win? Okay, good. We're Catholics, good. All right. We're Christians. No, it's important because some people don't actually believe that Jesus is one. I, I say that because sometimes we don't realize the truths that we profess. We don't see them being lived out. So, this is what we hear. The offspring will crush the head of the serpent. Well, isn't it funny that Jesus tells us that we will trample on serpents? Isn't that kind of funny? Did you ever wonder, did Jesus mean that we're supposed to get some snakes together and walk on them? No. That's not what he means. And isn't it curious that at the cross, Jesus looks at the disciple whom he loves, and he says to the disciple to look to Mary and to say, Behold your mother. Hmm. That means that spiritually, the disciples that Jesus loves are the offspring, spiritually, of the woman or of Mary, right? Right. And in Revelations 12, where we see in the, in the, in the, New, New, the New Testament that continuous war of the dragon or the serpent versus the woman and her offspring, when the dragon can't get either the child to gobble him up, or he can't get the woman by trying to spew water at her. She gets carried off by two wings of a giant eagle. He gets so mad he goes after the other offspring of the woman, it says. Those who bear witness to Jesus. So my question to you is this. If you're here today, aren't you a witness to Jesus? Yes. Okay. So it shouldn't surprise us that there's a war going on. But what should surprise us is that we actually sometimes give too much credence to the power of the enemy, right? The best thing in warfare, 
that one can do in order to defeat their enemy is what they call psychological operations, if any of you know. During the Gulf War, this was back in the 90s, right? During the Gulf War, the Allies dropped, not bombs, leaflets, telling Saddam Hussein's troops, basically, that the bombing was going to commence, that they should, get out, they, should, they should get out now, or they should surrender now. It's called an intimidation tactic, right? Right? And sometimes that's more important than actually winning the war, because if you can intimidate your enemy, you can get them to stand down. We're talking in the natural, right? Well, what ends up happening is this. With Hollywood beefing up the devil so much, we have this strange notion that God and Satan are in a wrestling match, and it's almost as if Satan can win. We have to know, first and foremost, who God is. Secondly, who the devil is. And third of all, who we are. Because if we don't, we're going to get confused. God is God. He's all-powerful. He's omnipotent. The devil is a fallen angel. He's a creature. He's not equal to God. He's not even equal to our guardian angels, the lowest of the angels. Now, if we compared the fallen nature of this fallen angel, right, versus the strength of our humanity, which is wounded, though still good, right, we wouldn't want to go head to head because angels are more intelligent. Even fallen angels are more intelligent than we are. That's why they're very good at lying, the demons, right? And we're good at believing them, (laughs) right? So what does God do for us to help us in our fight against the devil? Because Jesus said, hey, I'm equipping you guys. You guys, go, you guys do the works that I was doing. You guys go and defeat the works of the devil. That's very simple. Jesus said it in the scriptures, not in the gospel. We don't hear it today in this gospel. But in another gospel where we're hearing the same kind of confrontation, he says to the scribes and Pharisees, he says, listen... It's not by the bowl that I cast out demons. But if it is by the the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come among you. By the finger of God, he means the Holy Spirit. So imagine, one of the persons of the Trinity, and with that one person, two of the other persons, right? Because you can't divide the Trinity, right? Okay. Dwelling in us, empowering us to be able to say to the devil, step off. Get out of here. This is our place. In the beginning, if you look at Adam and Eve, right, God gave them authority over all creation. He gave them dominion, right? Okay? He said, be fruitful, multiply, subdue the earth. Okay? Well, they sinned. And then Satan comes along and many centuries later, and tempts Jesus and says, hey, I've got all the authority, right? And I can give it to you. How did the devil get it from Adam and Eve? It was given to them first, right? How did he get it from them? He got it from them by getting them to be afraid of him, to submit to his reasonings, and to sin. Okay? So Satan comes along, he tries to trick Jesus in shortcutting the process of having to defeat the devil. He says, I know what the devil's like, I know what you want. You want the authority back, I'll just give it to you. You just worship me. Well, that's a trick. Why? Because if Jesus worships him, he'd basically be confirming his authority, the devil's authority. Okay. So Jesus doesn't give in. He defeats the devil on the cross. And then after his resurrection, he says, all authority is... Mine. Go you guys, therefore, and proclaim the good news. So you see, Jesus got the authority back for us. And then he gave it to us so that we can do what? So that we can be fruitful, multiply, subdue the earth. We can go back to the original plan. Be fruitful as a church. Bringing to birth new Christians. Subdue the earth. Why? Because the other guy's still hanging around 
tricking people into the fact that so that he you know tricking people into the idea that he's in charge but he's not we see in the lives of the saints we could pick several of them but Padre Pio is a good example because Padre Pio who would pray he would pray for people they'd get healed right they didn't even have to be nearby him and the devil would come sometimes and he'd beat him up. A momentary light affliction we heard about in the second reading. We don't see in history any kings or queens who reign without opposition, right? And the greatest of them are always the ones who are able to overcome adversity. Just think of like a president, like President Lincoln, for instance. We think of him as one of the greatest presidents, and he really was. But there was a lot of opposition to him. Right? Right. So the fact that sometimes we as Christians experience opposition by the devil isn't a sign that something is wrong with us. It's a sign that there's something right with us. But the question is, do we know who we are? Do we know that we are the sons and daughters of God? Do we know that God has invested us with authority? To be able to stomp on the devil in our own personal lives and also in some instances in the lives of others. That we are called to be on offense, not on defense. Because you know the best way to get an army to not do anything is to make it think that it always has to defend itself. And then as they say, whoever defends everything ends up losing everything. As a Minnesota Vikings fan in football, I know, good defenses don't win football games. <laughs> right? Well, you need an offense. So why are there problems going on in the world today? It's because we don't realize we're on offense. We don't realize we have the best offense possible. We have God. When the angels fell, right, God created a certain number of angels. When Satan and some of those angels fell, it was only one-third of them that fell. That means that there are twice as many holy angels than there are demons. Do you understand what that means? Does that make sense? That means that even in the angelic realm, Satan is outnumbered two to one. Now, I'm not saying we should go and make friends with him and start talking to him because he's a good liar. But we shouldn't be afraid of him. Scripture tells us how we are to combat the devil. It says very simple. Submit to God. Resist the devil. He will take flight. We resist the devil by submitting to God. By remembering, hey, I'm God's. Hey, God gave me authority. I can say, in the name of Jesus, get out of here. And he has to obey. He does. Because of the authority in the name of Jesus. Right? So today at this Eucharist, when we receive Jesus himself, we want to be encouraged. We want to be completely and totally empowered by that, not to be afraid of the devil... But to know who we are, to know our identity, and to be willing to engage in the conflict that God has asked us to be a part of. Because let's face it, if we're not doing something, we're letting evil triumph, right? There's the old saying that the best way for evil to win is for good men and women to do nothing, right? If I want to cultivate a garden, but I do nothing to pull out the weeds, what's going to happen? The weeds are just going to grow. This maybe gets us a little uncomfortable because we're used to the idea that, no, no, God's got to take care of it all. He has, but then he's, he's asking us to participate. That's why in the Our Father we say, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, who just signed up by saying that? Who just signed on the dotted line? Not drafted, but volunteered. 
We did. Or did we not realize what we were saying? Once again, I, I kid around sometimes that when we say Mass, when we, when we say our prayer, sometimes we don't even know what we're saying, right? Like the priest will say, Behold the Lamb of God, and people will say, um, Lord, I'm not worthy to, to enter into your, I'm not worthy that you enter under my roof. And they're looking somewhere else. You know? I kid around, I say, it's one more time that people aren't listening to the priest giving a command. Behold the, Lord, the Lamb of God. <laughs> but we want to make sure we understand what it is that we're saying. Thy kingdom come. We're asking God, may your kingdom be made manifest now. What happens when the kingdom was made manifest when Jesus was walking around here? What happened? People were healed. The dead were raised. The devil was cast out. Right? So we just literally are inviting God every single time to do that. But we're saying, hey God, and we're, let, let it be done through us. Again, the reason why this is uncomfortable is because we don't know who we are. We've been lied to our, our lives by the devil who's been saying, oh, you're no good. You're just so full of sin and all this other stuff. We need to take courage by the psalm we heard today where it says, With the Lord there is mercy and plentiful redemption. Israel, indeed, he will redeem from all its iniquity. That's a promise. That's a promise. They can turn us into saints. Saints who can step on the devil. Saints who can make a difference in the world. All it takes is one person. One St. Francis built the faith back up in Italy, right? 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 This is the beautiful thing about being a Christian. Because with God, one person is a majority. God can take over and renew an entire nation through one willing Christian. Imagine what he can do with a bunch of us. So we want to be encouraged today not to be afraid of the devil. To know our identity as to who we are. A good recommendation that I have for those who are interested, a book by the name of Unbound by Neil Lozano. It's a good book to help one to know one's identity, that one's identity as a beloved son or daughter can be literally unbound from chains so that one can walk in greater freedom and also know that the devil doesn't have authority unless I give it to him. Amen.